Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Pray with me. Father, we come before you one more time as we sit under your word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word instructs us. Your word guides us. Your word rebukes us. That your word convicts us. That, Father, that it is your word that we need to live our lives each day. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that even today that your word would do its work through your spirit. Father, we come before you wanting to eagerly listen to your word and wanting to uh, submit to all that your word has to say and to live out these truths, and we pray that you would help us. Father, I also want to pray for myself, and I pray that you would help me as I speak your word, help me to speak the truth, help me to speak your word, help me to speak it clearly in a way that is beneficial for your people and in a way that exalts you, and we pray all these things. In Christ's precious name, amen. Imagine um, a person who's running through the woods and he comes to a dead end, to the end of a cliff. And he can see land uh, way on that side. It's too far away. And there's no way he can get from this side to that side, and the only thing that remains there is just this tiny little rope, or a, or a thin rope. And he's standing there thinking, how am I going to cross this? How am I going to get to the other side? Suddenly, all of a sudden, this professional tightrope walker walks by. He just happens to be in the forest. And, um, and he looks at the person and says, You want to get across that side? Let me help you. So he takes this person on his back, ties him up, secures him tightly, and starts this journey on this tightrope. Somewhere down the line, you know, it's the the divide is is huge. So it's gonna take quite some time to get to the other side. So somewhere, you know. Somewhere along this journey on the rope, this person who's tied up on his back says, oh, you know what? This is just too difficult. These, these ropes are a bit tight. It's a bit hot. It's a bit uncomfortable. I'm just going to find another way to get to the other side, so just cut me loose. What do you think you will tell this person? He's in the middle of this deep valley, this deep gorge, and the only thing that he is secured to is this professional tightrope person. If he lets go of this person, or if he's unbound from this person, that will be his end. You know, sometimes I think, even in our Christian lives, a poor analogy indeed, but there is a sense in which we can, sometimes when we look at our Christian lives, it can look that way. When we start off our Christian journey, there's Christ with us. He's there. And, and we're overjoyed and, yes, let's do this, and it's all about Christ, and we're going with him. And somewhere in that journey, things get a little difficult. There's trials coming, there's temptations coming, and, and all these difficulties coming. 
And then where, then you're tempted to think, this Jesus thing, is this really working? I, I mean, I, I know he started me off on this journey, but, but I'm not sure about getting over to the other side. I don't know if he's enough. Maybe I just need to cut loose from him and go to something else. You know, there are times in our Christian walk where sometimes Jesus can feel like that. That he is, although when we started with him, things were great, somehow as we're continuing on, he just feels distant. Yeah, he started my journey and he's somehow right there in the past, And yes, I'll see him in glory somewhere in the future, but in the present, Jesus is just, I don't know, he's just, can he really keep me going? Sure, he dealt with my past, he he will deal with my future, but can he really help me in my present? You know, the, the text that we read in Colossians, the Colossians have come to a sort of cross-junction in their life. They're young believers. This church is four or five years old. And there's false teachers that have crept in, and they're saying, yes, Jesus, you've started with him. He's, he's good and all that. But now what you need to grow, to spiritually mature, what you need is not just Jesus. You need some other things. You need some of the man-made things, and you need these rules and and mysticism and experience and all of that. And so they're being tempted to want to, you know, tempted to think, hey, maybe life is just so hard, maybe we should try that. And so Paul begins to write this letter as he hears of this news, as this heresy that is creeping into the church to tell them about the preciousness of Christ and to continue to hold on. That the way you started is the way that you will continue. That's the way you must go. I've titled this morning's sermon as Live in Christ. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a command, and I get that from, from the text itself where it says, so walk in him. So we're going to be talking about the Christian life, and I know some of you will know this, some of you may have forgotten it, and some of you may not even understand this fully. Whatever may be your case, I want you to pay attention and be reminded of what this life in Christ is all about, what this Christian life is is all about. I've divided the text into three parts. The, the, the first point is the basis of our Christian life or, or of our life in Christ, and that we'll see in the first part of verse six. Secondly, we'll look at the command that we are to obey in the Christian life, and that's in the second part of verse six. And thirdly, the details or the, or the specifics of the Christian life, of, of living our life in Christ. So firstly, the basis or the grounds of our Christian life. Look at the first part of Colossians 2, 6 again. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, therefore, when a verse begins with a therefore, you need to find out what the therefore is there for. You, know, you hear it time and again. So Paul's really bringing to a conclusion everything that he has said, and he's transitioning on to the main body of the text. This, this verse, these couple of verses, I would say, it's the central verse of the entire letter to the Colossians. It sums up what has been said and then it looks forward to what the rest of the book is going to be about. You see, when we think of what he has said so far, Paul has thanked God for the powerful work of the gospel. This powerful work is going on everywhere, and it's going on in the life of this particular church. And he's praying that this work, this powerful work, would continue to go on. And in 
at the very center of this powerful work is the person, Jesus Christ. It is him and his work that makes this powerful work possible. The one who is supreme, the one who is Lord of all creation and who is Lord of even new creation, where he's bringing about a new creation. And he's reconciling this broken world, this sinful world, back to himself. And part of that reconciliation process involves even this little church in the middle of nowhere. And then we saw in the last few weeks where this powerful work, even though Christ has gone, is now being achieved through servants of the gospel, and Paul is one of them. And so his suffering and his preaching and everything that he does and his striving, everything he does is so that others would know Christ and others would mature in Christ. And so now Paul is saying, so in light of all I've said, therefore, as you have received this Christ, this Christ, this magnificent Lord of all that you have received. Now this word received, it's, a, it's, it's often used as a technical term to refer to traditions that was transmitted from one person to another. I'm just going to quickly go through a few passages. 1 Corinthians 11.23, it reads this way. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed and took bread, I received from the Lord. Galatians 1.9, as we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be accursed. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And one last one, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. So the traditions, these, these weren't customs of men or you know, like family traditions or church traditions, that sort of thing. The traditions referred to what was received from God and then delivered to the people of God. It was the teachings, the doctrine, which included even the gospel message. And these were oral traditions. And later, these oral traditions and, and teachings, they, they became written traditions. And, and these written traditions now we have in the form of the New Testament or the Bible as a whole. So Paul is saying, you know, I've received from Christ himself, and he's passed it on to Epaphras, and this faithful Epaphras has faithfully passed on to all of you in Colossae this message of Jesus Christ, and you have received it. You know, and I think the reason that he's using this technical term, receive, is because the Colossians are in danger of exchanging what they have for some other man-made tradition. Look at verse 8. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, by empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. See, what these false teachers have is human tradition. Don't be tempted to drop what you already have received. And, and don't be tempted to pick up these human traditions of these false teachers. Remember what you have received. And look, it, it wasn't just teachings. Notice what it says. You received Christ. You received Christ. You received Christ himself. You received the person of Christ. See, it wasn't just 
what you received that, you know, you heard some intellectual thing, some doctrine, and you did a head nod, and there was this mental assent to some doctrine. No, while, yes, you need to acknowledge and believe in that doctrine of Jesus Christ, but it's more than that. When you believed in the doctrine of Jesus Christ, you received Jesus Christ. He, you came into a living relationship with him. You received Jesus Christ. Now, how does this receiving happen? It's through the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, as, a, as the word of God, as the gospel comes to a person, as, and as the Holy Spirit opens that person's spiritual eyes, and this person becomes aware of his sinfulness, and the great divide that there is between God and himself, and his eyes are captured by the truths of who Christ is and what he has done on his behalf, this person then believes in Christ, and his work, and he receives Jesus Christ. And I would say this is true of every believer, and this was true of the Colossian believers. But notice, it also says, you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Literally, it reads, you received the Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, Jesus Who's Jesus? This was the, the human name that was given to the second person of the triune God. As he came to this earth at his incarnation, that was the human name that was given. Jesus. This person, Jesus that you received, this person who is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one of the Jews who would save his people. Look, and you received him not only as the promised Savior, as the promised Messiah, but you also received him as the Lord, as the only Lord. See, there are no other lords, no other gods along with him. He is the only one sovereign Lord and Master. I mean, think about this. Colossians, they were, they were pagans. They were idol worshippers, and they would have a pantheon of gods that they would bow down to. They hated Jews. They hated the God of the Jews. And now he's saying, you Colossians, you who are this way, you have now believed and received in Jesus, this Jewish Messiah, this Jewish Savior, as your master and as your Lord, as ruler of all. Now, I would say that, you know, those of you here who are believers, who are truly Christians, I would say, isn't this your story as well? You know, when you first began, when you were first converted, you believed in Jesus. You believed in who he is and what he had done. And you submitted to him in worship and in thankfulness and in dependence on him. And, and, and you would say, Jesus Christ, you are my everything. Jesus was your everything. And, and nothing or no one came even remotely close to having any kind of same level or same level of importance as Jesus in your life when you first began, when you were first converted. Even the, in the, even the problems in your life, you know, when you were first converted, you weren't asking questions like, oh, but what about those relationship problems that I have? What about that, that problem with the job I have? What about my financial problem? What about this difficulty of mine and that difficulty? No, there was none of that. No, when you were first converted and you came to Jesus and you received him as your God and Savior and Lord, you simply submitted to him completely saying, Lord Jesus, you are my everything and I will do whatever you ask. Nothing else was ever in the picture. In fact, you would even open scripture and say, oh, this is what scripture says? then I guess I just have to obey. There was nothing like, oh, I, I, I wonder if it means that or that, and I wonder if there's a way in which I can find some excuse to not obey this verse. 
No, when you were first converted, when you first began, it was you saw it in the Word, you believed it, and you just submitted to it as the Word of God. This is what true conversion looks like. It's a believing in and a receiving of, G, of the Jesus of the Bible who is Savior and Lord. You know, there are many people in this world who say they believe in Jesus. You know, some say they believe in a Jesus who's a, who's a cute baby. You know, he comes out during Christmas and that's the end of it. Then there are others who believe in Jesus as, oh, he, he was a good guy who lived and... Uh, He had a few good things to say, and it might be well that we accept some of the things that he said, but that's it, nothing beyond that. Then there are still others who would say, yeah, he was a holy man, he was a man of God, but nothing more than that. You know, these people, even though they say they believe in Jesus, they don't believe in Jesus for the simple reason they do not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Then there are some who have some knowledge of Jesus, some knowledge of the Bible perhaps, and maybe even call themselves Christians, and, and they say that they believe in a Jesus who is a Savior, that he died for my sins, but he's not Lord over all. And I don't need to submit to him. See, the problem with that is if Jesus is not Lord over all, then he cannot save you from your sin. He cannot save you from Satan and death itself. He has to be Lord over all for you, for him to be your savior. And this is the only way that you can have saving faith. By receiving Jesus as the savior and as the Lord. And by implication, you accept him as your Lord. Now I want to ask you this morning, do you believe in this Jesus? Do you believe in this Jesus who is Savior and Lord of all? Have you received this Jesus of the Bible who is Christ and Savior and is Lord over all? If you haven't, if this is not your Jesus, then you have not received Jesus because what you believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible. But for those of you who are truly believers and who truly believe in this Jesus. This is something that has already happened in the past. It's a once and for all thing. And this was true even of the Colossian believers. They had received Jesus as Christ and as Lord. So in light of this past event, Paul now exhorts them to do something in the present. And here we look at the command in the Christian life. The command in the Christian life. Look at this, the last part of verse 6. So walk in him. In light of your past reality, this now should be your present endeavor. If you have received Christ, here's what you are to do. Walk in him. Now, we've looked at this word before, you know, when we looked at, uh, uh, when we looked at it in chapter 1, verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This walking, it's it's this Jewish idea of picturing one's life as walking along a path, as just a way of saying, you know, this is your way of life. You know, you, you... Read it in the New Testament. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God and so on and so forth. Or as you come to the Psalms, don't walk the way of the wicked. In the New Testament, there's things like don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. 
So, so this walking, it, it, it's a way of referring to the entirety of one's life. It, it, it's, it's that life, the entirety of one's life moving in a certain direction. And look, in, in Colossians 2, the word walk, it's used as an imperative. It's not a request. Oh, you know, in light of what has happened, if you've received Christ, perhaps maybe you should consider walking in Christ. No, it's a command. Walk in Christ. This is the first commandment that's given in this letter, and there are many more coming as we progress on in the letter. You know, I... One of the comforting things that I find in Scripture is that the commands in Scripture are always based on some indicative or or some fact or some reality. There's always a basis given for the command given. You know, but sometimes people get this idea that, oh, if Jesus has done it all, then the Christian life is just coasting on with Jesus. Jesus. And things will just happen by itself. Just automatically things will just happen in your Christian life. Because you've obviously received Christ. And and if if you've received Christ, things are supposed to just automatically happen. And so they say, don't don't talk about uh, what to do and things like that. Just, just, Just meditate on truths about who Christ is and what he has done. And life will be fine. You know, but this kind of thinking is just contrary to what Scripture teaches. See, because if the Christian life was just about the indicatives, about what Jesus had done and is doing and is going to do, then we might as well strike out all the commands in Scripture. It is precisely because we have a role to play in the Christian life that we are expected to be obedient to the commandments that we have been given these commandments. So the command, walk in him. And the basis of this command, we've already looked at that, that you received Christ Jesus, the Lord. Now you might be thinking, how how is that the basis? Why, Why do I say that's the basis for this command? Well, because the person who's received Jesus Christ, that person is now in union with Christ. You receive the person of Jesus Christ, now you are bound to him. You are in union with Christ. You can't undo this receiving of Christ. You can't separate yourself from this union with Christ. And so because you are in union with Christ, you have received Christ, you are bound to him, now walk or live in Christ in the reality of that union with Christ. The way you live should point to the fact that you are in union with Christ, that you are bound with Christ. So what that means for you and me is this, that it's not just on a Sunday morning or perhaps even a Wednesday night if you go for Bible studies, that you're walking in Christ. It also means that it's not just 10 minutes in the morning or 10 minutes at night when you're reading the word or praying that you're merely walking in Christ. No, it's, it's your entire life and your entire life should point to this reality that you are in Christ, that you are walking in Christ. Now, think of it this way. Think, think of a couple. If they told you that they were married. You know, marriage, according to the Bible, is then, after they're married, to be living as one flesh. But then you look at their life. The only time they are together is on a Sunday morning, or maybe a Wednesday night, or maybe 10 minutes of the day just here and there. But other times they're never together They don't live together. They don't share life together. There is nothing in that relationship. They practically live separate lives. So this kind of couple, you would have serious concerns with whether they're really married or not. 
And if they are married, you would say, if you are married, then you'd need to live in that reality of that one flesh union. You need to live life together as a husband and wife. Live in that reality because you are now united together. Now, in a much greater way, every believer is bound to Christ. Every believer is in union with Christ. And the command is given, now live in that union. Walk in Christ. So whether you're a student or a worker or a parent or a grandparent or a retired individual, let your life show that you are united to Christ, not just when you come on a Sunday morning or not just when you read your Bible and pray, but your entire life, the direction of your life should show forth that you are in Christ, that you are bound to Christ and you have an active living relationship with him. So what does this look like practically? You know, Paul spells this out, what this walking in union with Christ looks like in chapters three and four. I'll just, just quickly read through some of the things that Paul says. Walking in Christ, this is what it looks like. It's setting your minds on things that are above. It's putting off sexual immorality, covetousness, anger, lying, malice. It's putting on humility, patience, compassion, forgiveness, and love. Walking in Christ as Christian wives, it's, it looks like living in submission to your husbands. Walking in Christ as Christian husband, it looks like loving your wives and not being harsh with them. Walking in Christ as children, it looks like obeying your parents in everything. Walking in Christ as, as workers, it, it looks like doing your job well and what is expected of you from your boss. As bosses walking in, in Christ, it looks like treating your workers fairly and justly, not looting them of what is due, treating them fairly and, and, um, and giving them what is due and encouraging them. In a nutshell, walking in Christ is walking like Christ. Walking in Christ is walking like Christ. 1 John 2.6 puts it well when it says, whoever says he abides in him, talking about Christ, whoever says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Ought, ought to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. Walk in Christ. But notice what's being said here in Colossians 2.6. See, there's a comparison also that's being made here. It says, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. There's a comparison between your receiving and your walking. As you, walk, as you received, so walk. The manner in which you received Christ is the manner in which you need to continue to live your life. The manner in which you were first converted is the same manner in which you are to live your Christian life. And in what manner did they receive Christ? By faith. And by that same faith, you and I are also called to continue in our life in Christ. Think about this. When you first received Christ, it was by faith. That's how you received him having repented, having turned away from your sins, having turned away from the domain of darkness, you put your faith in Jesus the Savior and Lord and you submitted to him. Now in the same way, continue to turn away from your sin, continue to turn away from the domain of darkness. By that same faith, continue to live your life in submission to Jesus Christ the Lord. 
This is what you did at the start at your conversion. You are to continue doing the same, putting your faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, repenting and putting your faith in Him and turning to Him. Continue in the same way that you began. You started with Jesus in repentance and faith and in obedience to Jesus Christ. You started, when you started, you abandoned everything. You weren't holding on to anything. You weren't looking at yourself. You weren't looking at others. You weren't looking at the problems in your life. Nothing. The only thing that you were looking at was Christ and who he is and what he has done. And he was fully sufficient for you. He was fully supreme for you. And you were ready to do anything for him. That's how you started at your conversion. So then now... Continue to live in Christ in the same way in repentance and faith and obedience to Christ. Don't be tempted to think that the way forward is now somehow different from how you first began. Don't be tempted to think that you started with Christ and that was all good, but now you need something else to keep you going. Let me say this, if you think the Christian life, you know, once you're converted, in an instant, you're gonna be perfect, you're gonna be sinless, you're gonna be like Christ, then you're gonna be utterly disappointed and you will fall flat on your face and you won't get anywhere in your Christian life. That is not the Christian life. But just as you began, if you continue to live in repentance and faith in Christ. You see, when every time that you sin, you repent from your sin and you run to Christ and you put your faith and trust in Him. And you seek His forgiveness. And then you're encouraged to live in Him. You're encouraged to walk in Him. You're encouraged to obey Him by faith. Why? Because you see all that He has done for you. And all that He is. And you say, Jesus is sufficient. He has forgiven me of my sins. Why would I want anything else? I'm going to keep moving in this direction. If you do that, then you will walk and make progress and you will mature. Walk in Jesus Christ. And you know, it's not just commands like this that God has given us to help us to continue to live in faith, uh, in obedience to Christ, to help us to remember that we are in union with Christ and to continue to live in that reality. You know, there's other things that God has graciously given to us even, even in our church gatherings, in the way that it is structured, God has placed some reminders to remind us of this reality. Communion, the Lord's Supper, we, we took part from the Lord's table this morning. What is it reminding of? Uh, Kamal reminded us this morning. That reality of that we died, to, died with Christ and we were buried and we were resurrected. That we were one with Christ and one with one another. But often we also give a warning there before taking part from the Lord's table. And we say, do not take part in, we read this from 1 Corinthians 11, and we say, and we quote it and say, so don't take part in the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And what does that mean? It it doesn't mean that suddenly we've made ourselves worthy or somehow this one week there was perfection and only then we can take part from the Lord's table. No, it's talking about living in unrepentant sin. See, and the reason for that warning is ultimately not to deter that believer and say, oh, you know what? Oh, that's right. If I'm in unrepentant sin, I should not take part from the Lord's table because judgment will come on me. So what I'm going to do is I'm just not going to take part from the Lord's table. No, that's not why that warning is there. That warning is there so that the believer understands if they are living in unrepentant sin, that they would truly repent and come back to Jesus and live in that reality of union with Christ, walking in obedience with him, and reaffirm that by taking part in the Lord's table. That's why the warning is there. It's not 
purely for the sake of the believer to abstain from the table. It's to deter the believer from being in unrepentant sin. See how gracious God is? That he would do even things like this to remind us to continue to walk in him. There's, a, there, there's another structure or order that God has put in our church gathering. And that's called as church discipline. We see that in Matthew 18 verses 15 through to 17. You know, and, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can read it up there as it comes up. But it's the idea of when somebody who calls himself or herself a believer is beginning to live in sin, is not walking in Christ, is not walking in that reality of union with Christ, then you are to go to that believer, or you are to go to that person, whether a male or a female, go and say, hey, listen, you said you have received Christ and that you're in union with him, but the way you're walking now shows something else. Don't do that. Come back. And you plead with them and you beg with them and you, and, and you call them as much as possible. This is who Christ is. Don't you remember if you have indeed received Christ, who Christ is? It's never about you. It's always been about Christ. It's, it was about Christ when you started. Why would it be any different right now? And then if the person doesn't, doesn't listen to you, then, then you'd get another, another person with you, another witness with you, and you go to that person. Again, plead and, and call that person to repentance and to turn back to Christ. But that, but that person says, no, I, I'm, I'm just going to live this way. The person is in denial. The person is living in unrepentant sin and just continues to go on. Well, then the Bible says, then you are to tell it to the church, tell it to the entire body. And the entire body then goes to this person and says, please come back. We are a body of Christ. We have been united to Christ. We are members of this body. Do not go far away from this. And still the person says, no, I want to live my life. Then the Bible says, then the, treat this person as an unbeliever. You see, the reason, again, why this church discipline is there, especially for the believer, if the believer is living in unrepentant sin, it's so that then when they are given these warnings and when people come and plead and woo them and call them back to Christ, they will say, oh my goodness, I'm living like the world. I'm bound to Christ. No, I, I repent and I come back. It's for the sake of them being reconciled and being restored back to God. To be restored in that living relationship and to live in light of that truth. Unless, of course, that person is indeed an unbeliever and then the person just goes the way of the world. So continue to walk in Christ, in faith and in obedience to Jesus Christ the same way that you started. And now we come to our third point, and that's the specifics, the, the, the details of the Christian life. Let me just read, start with verse 6 again and read on to verse 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, and now the third point, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. You know, it's, it's giving explanation to the command that's been given of walking in Christ. If there was ever doubt, you know, this, this walking in Christ, is, is that a certainty? Can I do this? Then this verse gives you assurance, this verse gives you confidence that you can indeed do it if you have indeed received Christ. It talks about how this, how this works, how this walking, continuing to walk in Christ looks like. 
And there are four participles used. Participle is the ing word, you know, I'm going, I'm bringing, I'm singing, the ing words. And there are four participles that are used here. And I know as we read our version, the ESV version, we don't see it. And that's why for this I prefer the NASB translation because it, it captures the tense and the, um, and the participle action and the mood of the verbs as well. This is what the NASB reads. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Four participles. Having been firmly rooted, being built up in him, being established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So the first word there, having been rooted. The word rooted, it's an agricultural term. It's, it has the idea of a, of a plant with deep roots that have gone into the soil. It's a deeply planted plant. See, the, the, and the verb rooted, it's in the perfect tense. It, what that means is this, this deep rooting, these deep roots, it's something that has happened in the past and it has ongoing effect in the present. You, it's having been rooted, it's something that has happened in the past, and, but it has its effects even now in the present. And it's also in the passive form, and this just means that this is something that was done to you. We looked at this passive active thing, it's, it's the difference between I throw the ball, that's active, and the ball is thrown to me, the action is done to me, that's passive. And so this is a passive form, meaning this is something that was done to you. So what it's saying is, you didn't do the rooting yourself, it was God who was doing this. Look, he's not saying walk in Christ and now root yourself in Christ. No, you have been rooted in Christ and this was God's doing. When you began, when you were converted, you were deeply rooted and deeply planted in the soil of Jesus Christ. Your roots have sunk deep into Christ and about who he is and what he has done. It's gone deep. You've been planted deep in Christ. You've been rooted in Christ. See, so the idea is that when difficulties come and, and the trials come and the, and the temptations come, that you're not going to be up, uprooted from where you are. You know, the, the parable of the sower comes to mind as I, I was thinking about this. Let's just quickly go through this. Matthew 13, verses 3 to 9, and then after that, 18 to 23. Matthew 13, 3 to 9. Let me read this quickly. And he told them in many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now what does this mean? We'll look at verses 18 to 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and, in, and immediately receives it with joy, and yet he has no fruit in, no root in himself, 
but endures for a while, but when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, and in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. See, this is true of every believer. If you have received Christ then you have been deeply planted in Christ. So no matter what happens, persecution, trial, or temptation, you are firmly and deeply rooted in union with Christ, in Christ. And the reason why believers then thrive no matter what the circumstance is because of this simple reason. They have been deeply rooted in the rich soil of Christ. So here's here's where I think Paul is getting at. The way to continue on in your life is to know that you have been deeply planted in Christ by God. So what that means for you, dear Christian, is that no matter what life throws at you, go back to the beginning of your Christian life, go back to your roots, and know that God has done this work of planting you deeply in Christ. And this, knowing this, that you are deeply rooted in Christ, this was not done by you, this is God's doing. No matter what the circumstance, it will keep you going on. In fact, it will give you assurance to keep you going on. There's a second picture given with regards to walking in Christ. It says there, and now being built up in him. If the first picture was about anchoring and stability and things like that, this is a picture of growth. From the image of plants, now we go to the image of buildings. It's the idea of a building being constructed, one brick after another. And look, the being rooted, having been rooted, that was in the past. That happened at your conversion. That happened when you received Christ. But this, this building up, this is in the present tense, meaning that this activity is now, currently, ongoing, continuously going on. And look, this word is also in the passive, which means you're not doing this building up. It's God who's doing the building up. So the idea here is of God constructing a building God is working and building and growing this individual, this Christian. And I think this is so important even for the Christian to understand. See, you know, there might be times in your life where you think, I don't, I don't see much growth in my life. I, I, I don't see much happening. I don't see much change in my life. I know I've been rooted in Christ, and I know for a fact that I have received Christ as Jesus and Lord, but I don't see much growth in my life. So Christian, let me say this. When you go through these doubts, and all you see in your life is your failures and difficulties, know this, that God is doing a construction work in you. He is working in you, he is changing you, he is growing you, and you must, by faith, believe that God is doing this work. You might not see it in that instant, but if you truly have received Christ, and if you truly believe and know that you've been rooted in Christ, regardless of what you may see on the outside, you must believe by faith that God is working and building you up. See, because if you don't believe this way, if you don't trust that God is working in you, then you won't be encouraged to live your Christian life, especially when you see no change and all you see is your failures. How is that going to encourage you to keep walking in the Lord? 
I did this and I failed. I did this and I failed. I did that and I failed. That is not going to encourage you to continue in your walk in Christ. But it is the fact that you have been rooted in Christ and that now God is doing a work in you. He is building you up. He's constructing. He's building you up. He's growing you. He's changing you. And that should be the motivation and assurance for you to keep going on and to keep continuing. And you have to believe this by faith. The same way you believed when you first began. Now we come to the third participle to explain the Christian walk, and that's being established in the faith just as you were instructed. Being established. Now this word, uh, you know, it was used often to legally guarantee something. So it has the idea of uh, guaranteeing, of, of validating. You see this uh, in Mark 16, 20. Just turn with me over there. Mark 16, 20. And it reads, And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. That word there, confirm, it's that same word. Establish, confirm, validate, guarantee. What it's saying here in Mark 16, 20 is that they went out and preached everywhere and their, the, their accompanying signs, the miracles that they did, validated the message that they preached. Guaranteed the message that they preached. So being established, look, and this is again a passive. This is not something that you're doing. You're not validating yourself. You're not guaranteeing yourself. God is doing this validation or guaranteeing. And it says, being established in the faith. What is the faith? It's not our subjective faith, but it's the objective faith, the, the body of truth, the body of doctrine, which make up the gospel as well. You know, we'd say, continue in the faith. So you might be thinking, so how, how is God guaranteeing somebody in the faith, in the teachings and all of that? Well, I think it goes something like this. As, as, you, as you walk in Christ, being fully aware of the fact that you, you have indeed received Christ and you are rooted in Christ and that God is building you up, and that God is changing you and then at some point you begin to see some external fruit, you see some external changes even in your life, what's that gonna do? Then God, by doing all these things, confirms to you and those around you that you are in the faith. Validates that you are in the faith. Establishes you that you are in the faith. And this is again God's doing. That assurance comes that you are in the faith. That's again God's doing as you depend on him and as you see him working and as you depend on him and as you continue to walk that walk, God establishes you in the faith. And lastly, the last part is called abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving. Now the first three were talking about God's activity. What, you know, behind the scenes, what, what, it, what is it that God has done? He's, he's rooted you, he's building you up, and he is, he's establishing you. He's confirming things that you are in the faith. And I think this last one just sums up just our response, or, or the very goal of all that God is doing. And that's to abound in thanksgiving. Abounding, it has this idea of, it, it's continuous. And it's not just a, oh, give thanks here and there. But it has this idea of overflowing. Think of a cup, and you pour water, and now it's just overflowing. There's abundance of it. Thankfulness, 
abounding in thankfulness. That is your response. That's what, you know, as you walk this walk and as you realize this is all that God is doing, that your response needs to be. See, thankfulness, I I would say it's at the heart of every Christian. And I think we need to fight for this because we live in a country of whingy people. Always complaining about this or that. And so when we, we are bombarded with just whinginess everywhere, everyone complaining about everything, we lose sight of what God is doing. And suddenly our worldview becomes atheistic, whether it's in our own lives or in the lives of our fellow believers, as though God is not doing any work. But it is precisely because God is doing a work that God is changing you and I, we need to recognize God for that and give him thanks for that. Why? Because there's no way we can do this. The reason we can walk is because he has rooted us and he is building us up. He is growing us. That's why we can walk. And so it would be wrong and even sinful for us to not be in that state of giving thanks to God, ever abounding in thankfulness. Otherwise, we're just like everybody else who does not believe in God and does not see God. And isn't that the point in Romans 1? That although they knew God, they did not give thanks to God and they did not worship God. God is everywhere and he's working even in nature, but unbelievers say, no, I do not submit to that. I do not recognize your worth and I will not give thanks to you. But the heart of a believer, at the core of his being, as he walks and as he realizes this is what God is doing, should be abounding and overflowing with thanksgiving. And we should continue to look for it. And if we can't find it, go back to truths of scripture. Yes, this is what scripture has said. This is who Jesus is. Gain assurance from that and give thanks to God. So let me ask you, how is your Christian walk? Maybe it's going well, maybe it's not going so well. But I pray that if indeed you have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that you continue in that same path, the same way you started, you continue in the same path. And the reason that you can do that is because when you receive Christ, you were rooted deeply in Christ, that you were then, now God is doing a work where you're being built up and you're being established, and God is confirming to you that you are in the faith, and that then your life be lived in full thankfulness. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for your work. We recognize that we don't always give you thanks, the thanks that is due. But we, we know for a fact that you are always at work. In fact, you are always at work in the lives of each of the believers. And Father, so even in light of that, help us never, never, ever to take that for granted. But be in dependence on you, dependent on Christ. Just the same way when we began and our love for him was great and all we could think about and live for and everything was about Christ. I pray that we would cling on to that reality and continue to walk in union with him, knowing that you are continuing to do this work. Father, help us, we pray, and I pray that even as we live in this body, that we recognize that we have this responsibility of encouraging each other in what God is doing in each other's lives. And we pray that we would do this for the good of your people and for your glory. We praise in Christ's precious name. Amen.